thank very much Masume and Simon for this uh, very enlightening um, event. Actually, I have to admit that as I was listening to Simon, I started to rewrite my conclusion. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll see where we end up. Um, I would also like to thank uh, Zeynep and her team for wonderful uh, logistical support. And I also owe a debt of gratitude to my student assistant, Furkan Inan, for helping me with some of the tables that you will see. I'll start with a quote. To this mosque, there shall be appointed 10 persons who have great skill and talent in reading the Quran with a beautiful voice. These persons will gather every Friday in the mosque shortly before noon. Every one of them will read from the Holy Quran with a soul caressing and beautiful voice in a way that will awake pleasure in the listener by closely following the traditions and rules of chanting and reciting." End of quote. These words are from the 1582-83 title deed of the charitable endowment or waqf that belonged to Nurbanu, wife to Selim II, mother to Murad III, and patron of the Atik Valley de Mosque complex in Istanbul. And um, she also endowed this beautiful Shirazi Quran copy, which you can see in the uh, exhibition to that very same mosque. Based on the argument that for most Muslims, the everyday lived experience of the Quranic text occurred through its oral rendition, as described in this source, this paper will examine the Masahif from the vantage point of its acoustic rendition. A representative sample of 14 of Mimar Sinan's mosques in Istanbul will serve as case studies to investigate the interplay between Quranic recitation and built environment. Their soundscapes can be reconstructed with the help of endowment deeds preserved in the archives. So following to, uh, an introduction to the orality and orality of the Quranic text, Mimar Sinan's measures to construct an appropriate acoustic space and the reciter's location within the prayer hall, I will consider both shape and content of the recitation programs. My overall aim is to retrieve 16th century Ottoman worshippers' experience of the Holy Word. So while Christian understanding of scripture focuses on silent reading, in Islam it cannot be separated from its acoustic rendition. As we all know, the first verses uh, revealed around 610 to the prophet were orally conveyed through the angel Gabriel and they were recite in the name of thy Lord and cherisher who created. The name Quran itself means recitation and the text was, and still is, meant to be recited loudly in a reenactment of the initial revelation. The oral nature of the Quranic text is evident in several characteristics. Phrases and patterns frequently repeat themselves. Rhyme allows for easy memorization and recall, and oaths and exhortations presuppose a listening audience. It is also evidence in what Michael Sells has called sound figures. Complex sound patterns stretch over lengthy passages, accentuate theologically critical moments, and create bridges to preceding and following passages. Hence, sound and meaning are intertwined. For example, the Arabic sound ha denotes a female pronoun, but can also be an interjection of surprise, wonder, or sorrow and often ties together key rhymes. In Christina Nelson's words, the significance of the revelation is carried as much by the sound as by its semantic information. In other words, the Quran is not the Quran unless it is heard. This explicit orality had two consequences. Because the reception of the revelation is an auditory process, the ability to hear has become conflated with that to truly understand the revelation. The second consequence is the formation of a system that determines how the Quranic text should be read in terms of rhythm, timbre, sectioning, and phonetics. And the system is called Ilm al-Tajweed or Ilm al-Qur'at and was also taught in the recitation schools in Darul Qura of Ottoman mosque complexes. Different manners of recitation rested on the authority of famous reciters who established substantial followings, resulting in seven major and three minor canonical readings. 
Reciters chanting the Quran in mosques usually use a melodic style called tajweed in contrast to tartil, a steady, even chant. A skilled reciter uses effects such as extension of phonemes, nasalization, pauses, and repetition in a way that emphasizes specific passages, suggests multiple meanings, and increases dramatic tension. Thus, the reciter enhances the listener's emotional participation in the text as event and involves them affectively, intellectually, and spiritually. This emphasis on the experience of Quranic recitation could not have been unbeknownst to architects. Mosque space is not only a place for the community to gather or a visual emblem to the presence of Islam, but also a stage for the performance of the Quranic text as event and the reenactment of the initial oral revelation. Architects must have thought of ways to optimize the sensual and in particular the acoustic experience of this ritual event. Some Ottomans considered the performance in particular mosques superior and even, thought, uh, even sought out those mosques, a practice that a 16th century Mufti tried to curb. His fetwa ruled as canonically not permissible to attend congregational prayer in a mosque other than in the worshippers' residential quarter if the reason for attending the different mosque was to listen to a better recital. <laughs> that Sinan was concerned with the acoustic quality of his interior spaces becomes obvious from his conscious use of building elements and technical means to create a space ideal for Quran recitation. So ideally, a mosque affords users from all points good audibility and visibility of the Qibla wall. And good audibility depends on an even dispersion of the initial sound reflections, a good reflection of all frequencies, and an even decay of sound during reverberation time. And that's uh, abbreviated as RT. RT requires a careful balancing so that on one hand it is long enough to amplify sound and to give the sound a numinous character, while on the other hand it is short enough to make speech intelligible. Sinan's aesthetic preference for domed centralized spaces might have worked to the acoustics disadvantage. A concave ceiling usually does not reflect sound evenly. It causes sound reflections to converge in one single spot, so-called acoustic hotspots. Another problem of square or rectangular mosque spaces is the potentially destructive interference of standing waves as a result of sounds reflected from two parallel walls. So what technology could Sinan use to counteract these disadvantages? And what was the resulting acoustic quality in, for example, the Suleimanie? Well, first, Sinan was able to manipulate the mosque interior's volume as much as static requirements, the assigned plot of land, and imperial building regulations allowed by adjusting the height and the dome's circumference. A large volume results in longer reverberation time, and the Suleimania, with its height of approximately 40, 48 meters and volume of about 115,000 cubic meters is a case in point. The distribution of building elements and the wall's articulation also provided structural means to ensure homogeneous sound. Not only for visual and structural purposes, but also in order to refract and diffuse sounds, Sinan added abutting half domes and smaller lateral domes and inserted windows in the walls. And he also chose four columns as the load-carrying structural elements surrounding the central unit. Thereby, he created both visual and acoustic continuity between the side wings and the central space. Walls and floors also played an important role in determining RT. Due to its flax or hemp fiber contact, the Horasan plaster is quite sound absorbent. In contrast, tiled surfaces are highly sound reflective. Rugs not only provided a softer surface for the worshippers to kneel, but also served as a sound absorptive measure, as shown in a quantitative study by Prodi and Marcillo. And according to the same study, Sinan also took into consideration the sound absorbing quality of the worshippers bodies, which could count up to 4,500. The most obvious evidence for Sinan's knowledge of mosque acoustics is his usage of sound vessels, also known as Helmholtz resonators. And these were inserted in the dome. 
Now, the exact number is not clear, as in the course of restorations, they were plastered over. Um, they have been opened up again, but um, I have so far not been able to measure the vessels. I cannot comment on their absorptive qualities, which depend on volume, length, and diameter of the neck. But in any case, it is well known that uh, Helmholtz resonators hemispherically re-radiate unabsorbed sound. So with their help, Sinan was able to absorb undesirable frequencies and at the same time diffuse sound in the dome to avoid these acoustic hotspots. The overall results are that the Suleimania Mosque constitutes a very reverberant live space. Lower frequencies of around 500 hertz have a reverberation time of eight seconds and therefore interfere with speech intelligibility. Higher frequencies of around one kilohertz have an RT of 5.9 seconds. And since Quran reciters usually chant in a fairly high register, the resulting RT of 5.9 affords intelligibility while also leading to a particular timbre effect. And this point I would like to play you a sound simulation produced by the Charisma team. And this is what you will hear when you stand in the center of the Suleimani, listening to a recital located 28 meters away from you. And um, since I don't think I'm able to, oops, no. Allah. Ah, yeah. Allah. Allah. Within this carefully constructed acoustic space, where exactly were the recitals located? To answer this, we primarily have to look to architectural features, um, textual references of you, uh, and we have uh, one pictorial uh, reference, for example, with the Tableau General, which is also included in this uh, exhibition. Um, reciters and preachers platforms can be found integrated, for example, in the Suleimania, where they're attached to three of the four central piers. To the fourth pier, right of the mihrab, and supported by 16 columns, is attached the large muezzins platform, where reciters also would have sat in larger groupings, as is shown here uh, for the Hagia Sophia. Opposite the muezzins platform is a rectangular pulpit on seven porphyry columns. As I could try out myself with the two small rear platforms, uh, one single person with a Quran stand in front of them can comfortably sit on it. The Nishanji Mehmed Pasha Mosque features two small stone pulpits integrated in the Qibla wall corners. The pointed arches of the square platforms with their beautifully carved balustrades are supported by two engaged and one freestanding colonnette, the latter made of porphyry, and the pulpits are accessible over staircases hidden inside the walls. It is also for this mask that the foundation charter clearly specifies some of the reciter's location. Surah Al-Kahf was to be read every Friday by one reciter on the Mahfil, the platform at the front. And so was Surah Al-Fatah after every morning prayer by one of the four muezzins. Of course, another space uh, where muezzins and reciters could sit were galleries or balconies that are often found above the portal. In addition, wooden pulpits could be moved around inside the prayer hall. And of course, reciters could also sit anywhere on the floor. Uh, now, it might be a worthwhile future research project to create acoustic models of these various options and compare how location would have influenced the audibility and quality of recitation. But so much can be said at this point. Locations higher above the ground, as facilitated by platforms, ensure a better dispersion of sound and greater audibility in a crowded prayer hall. So for this study, I have surveyed the 14 mosques listed here, and the criteria for selecting them were the following. First, the endowment deed needed to be preserved and accessible and contain information about reciters. Secondly, the patrons needed to constitute a fairly coherent group, so due to their relationship with the Ottoman court, because they were viziers, court officials, or female members of the Sultan's family, uh, they shared a similar cultural horizon and tastes. And of course, they needed to have access to Sinan's services as head of the Imperial Guild of Architects. And third, even though it's a coherent group, there still needed to be uh, a cross-section of patrons of different status. 
So uh, surveying the endowment deeds, I managed to put together this table, which among other things shows the presence and frequency of the recital of certain suras. I will not go over all of this, but based on this survey, one may actually reconstruct the normative or typical Ottoman mosque and its standard message in the following way. The day would typically start after the morning prayer with a recitation of Surah Yasin. This is considered the heart of the Quran and mentions the central figure of the religion as well as the central doctrine of revelation and the hereafter. After the afternoon prayer, the Ottoman visitor would hear Al Imran about the general religious history of mankind and the birth of Islam, as well as the duty of Christians to convert. The day concluded after the evening or night prayer with Al-Mulk, which can be compared to the hymns or psalms of other faiths, reminding of the contrast between the surface world and the inner world and describing the spiritual in terms of things humans can see and understand. Therefore, the oral message uh, progressed over the day from the most significant teachings of Islam to the place of Islam in human history and finally to the spiritual content of the religion didactically this constitutes a well-conceived and logical thematic progression. So here at this point, we should also refer to Gülön Ejipolo's notion of decorum in mosque architecture. According to her, the mosques reflected certain expectations of propriety relative to the rank of the mosque patrons. This ensured that each mosque was appropriate to the rank of the patron in terms of cost, site, functional program, plan type, number and size of domes, number of minarets, facade, construction materials, ornamentation, and epigraphy. But of course, norms and rules are there to be broken. There always existed ways and means to personalize a standardized template, whether a mosque or a recitation program. In fact, only in two uh, of the surveyed mosques uh, this box standard recitation program was featured, uh, Kara Ahmed Pasha's and Sukolo Mehmed Pasha's mosques. The majority of the patrons, however, made adjustments. In five cases, the standard program was augmented by one or two more unusual surahs or parts thereof, and their content can be interpreted as conveying a message of particular import to the patron. And after listening to Simon, I would uh, just like to point out Al Inam in the Suleimania Mosque, which was recited by 41 reciters. And um, this is also something that Gülön Ejipolo has argued. This has a particular political dimension because um, the very last um, uh, verse refers to God giving special power to specific persons. So Suleiman is kind of uh, advertised as a divinely appointed ruler in this case. <laughs> In three cases, the program was reduced to one or two standard suras, maybe for economic reasons, meaning not having to pay uh, recited salaries, or maybe due to the patron's indifference towards Quranic recitation as an art form. But usually, Yasin, the heart of the Quran, remained. In two cases, the Vakfi does not specify any surah at all, but only mentions the recitation of 10 verses that are not further identified or the chanting of a Jew's 30th portion. And in two cases, the patrons entirely deviated from the standard program, Hadum Ibrahim Pasha and Mola Chelebi. And the latter, whose mosques you can see here, for example, had the opening Surah Al-Fatiha recited after every single prayer. I now want to turn to Hadum Ibrahim Pasha and the unusual Quranic soundscape that he created in his modest mosque near the old Byzantine city walls at Silivri Kapo. Hadum Ibrahim Pasha, possibly of Bosnian origin, was the chief white eunuch and guardian of the imperial palace under Suleiman the Magnificent. He also held successive positions as governor general of Anatolia, fourth vizier, second vizier, and lieutenant governor of Istanbul. The Ottoman official and historian Mustafa Ali described him as possessing unquestionable dignity and propriety. His decorous mosque consists of a 12 meter diameter dome on a cubical base fronted by a portico as befits the patron's rank. Yet the recitation program exhibits a few idiosyncrasies. 
After morning prayer, instead of Yasin, worshippers heard six reciters chanting the four verses of Al Ihlas 500 times each. Say, He is Allah, the one and only, Allah the eternal absolute. He begetteth not, nor is he begotten, and there is none like unto him. Thus, these reciters emphasize the oneness of God in contrast to the concept of Trinity, a statement that is suitable and particularly poignant in a neighborhood that was actually dominated by Christians. Then, a group of seven, the, four, uh, the imam, the four muezzins, one teacher and one student recited al -Enam. This surah describes the nature of God and the emptiness of this world's life in contrast to his creation, reminds that the rebellious will be punished, and gives divine legitimization to power. Now, a detailed political interpretation requires a closer look at the Pasha's biography, uh, which is beyond the scope of this paper, but which I'm uh, actually planning for, for an article. So much should be said here. Hadim Ibrahim Pasha appears to have been particularly interested in promoting the education of reciters. In addition to teacher and student chanting al -Enam, he stipulated that five young reciters read 10 verses after Friday prayer, a stipulation unique in its emphasis on age. Moreover, in terms of a ranking of the 14 mosques based on the number of reciters, um, by employing 55 reciters, Hadim Ibrahim Pasha managed to push his way past several grand viziers and even Sultan Suleiman's daughter Mihrima. Constructing a larger mosque would have meant breaching the decorum, an act contrary to his purported dignified and proper character. However, recitation presented an acceptable way to elevate his status. To conclude, even if architectural history's emphasis on vision as primary mode of perception and inquiry may never be shifted, the role of Quranic recitation as integral to the original conception and design of Ottoman mosques is beyond doubt, much like reciters' platforms were integral to some prayer halls. A wealth of archival material allows us to reconstruct the Quranic soundscape of foundations across the vast empire and over many centuries. It allows us to investigate the tension between decorum and individuality. And it allows us to identify the idiosyncratic attitudes and preferences of patrons, which they broadcast to a larger public of worshipers by means of their recitation programs. And after Simon's talk, I would like to add that, you know, um, putting together these programs may actually help us to understand the selection of surahs uh, that were endowed as manuscripts to specific mosques and tailored to the recitation programs. Last but not least, we should not forget that the words inscribed in the stunning Quran copies on display at the Freer Sackler were not meant to remain silent on the pages. Rather, they were intended to soar through beautiful architectural spaces, such as the mosques constructed by Mimar Sinan. Thank you.